without much delay hand over this podium to you it's all yours sir for the afternoon thank you thank you for doing me the honor and uh, i think you are uh, praising me a bit too much i'm getting a little embarrassed so but anyway uh, let's get on to the topic this is something that uh, yeah as you see is something that i'm quite interested in uh, and uh, even though i'm a neurologist obviously uh, i'm looking on this as as uh, a physician and perhaps even more as a citizen and i'd like to start by thanking uh, palium for having me uh, speak to uh, this group uh, this is yes so there we are can everybody see my uh slides yes yeah. sir we so, are good to go yeah so the thing is that uh, at one level it is not just us as doctors or as uh, uh, healthcare workers but it's also us as citizens that we have to understand end of life care for our personal selves as well so give me a minute i need to get my laser pointer on yes so the thing is that uh, uh we don't usually think about death or at least not think about your own death and uh, we certainly don't think about dying with pain and suffering so the uh, classic uh, quip on this is from a guy called Woody Allen who said i'm not afraid of death i just don't want to be there when it happens and that's the way most of us seem to look at it so for instance we have a fair amount of discussion on quality of life which is has to do with well being and so on but what about quality of death what it actually means is a good life till the very end and more importantly minimization of suffering problem is you have to to minimize suffering you have to measure it because it's only if you can measure it that you can work on improving it and uh, from there it leads to a sense of what patients have as rights at the end of life and to set boundaries uh, i know you are being trained in palliative care palliative care is applicable to all serious health related suffering but it uh, uh, comes together towards the end of life even though end of life care is a significant part of it there's much more to palliative care than end of life care uh, we identify end of life care as when somebody has uh, it's variably defined some people put it as one year some people put it as six months and terminal care is when it comes down to an even shorter period weeks to months and actively dying is even shorter than that usually days to hours uh, when it the whole process becomes irreversible and it is based on physiological parameters now as you can see uh, it's only when you come to actively dying that you can be really certain of what you are diagnosing uh, both end of life care and terminal care are uh, will we use indicators but very often they are things that you can identify only in retrospect so if you want a definition then a terminal illness is one from which recovery cannot be expected with the available treatment and death is considered to be unavoidable in the foreseeable future so end of life care then is an approach to a terminally ill patient that shifts the focus of care to symptom control comfort quality of life and quality of dying but with support for the family as well and it is at this point that treatments aimed at cure and or prolongation of life can be stopped because they are now useless uh in uh, almost over 20 years ago this paper appeared and one of the key uh, this is one of the graphs that has become pretty much the most quoted in uh, palliative care and end of life care it shows the trajectories uh, of disease towards the end of life and we will be looking at them in a little more detail as you go along a lot of us imagine that death is going to be sudden now the thing is that uh, sudden death actually doesn't isn't that common after the age of 50 or 60 this is because people who have uh, all kinds of risky behaviors uh, you can think of soldiers or terrorists or motorcycle enthusiasts or whatever or uh, 
high flying executive smoking away uh, all of them those who have to pass on suddenly are usually gone before them and all these things have settled down so by the time you come past the age of uh, 50 or 60 uh, you really have to have a lot of punya like a former long head president to die suddenly he died suddenly at the age of about 84 or 85 uh, literally he was lecturing and two hours later he was gone um what about cancer now out of the three major uh, categories of uh, disease which end in death uh, cancer and other terminal illnesses uh, people often begin at a fairly high level of function and uh, nowadays with uh, uh, all kinds of uh, therapies chemotherapy and so on they actually do maintain a fairly good level of functioning until uh, the a uh, malignancy burden begins to get out of control and then uh, the 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 downfall is fairly predictable far more predictable than in other causes of death and uh, malignancy typically uh, takes people in their 60s so we call it the waterfall trajectory and cancer now accounts for 20% of all deaths but it's probably falling as we get better and better treatments uh when people hit their 70s then it's uh, organ failure uh, due to uh, it could be diabetes hypertension or uh, uh, kidney heart lung liver failure due to any cause and this accounts for about 15% of all deaths and we call this the looping or the entry reentry trajectory and this is because Uh, as people head into a crisis they come into hospital they come out of it usually not as good as before then again and then again and finally they pass on during a crisis and uh, the last trajectory uh, which people enter at a pretty low level of already at a lowish level of function uh, is usually even later in life in uh, the 80s and we call this the frailty and uh, dementia uh, trajectory it's called the dwindling uh, trajectory and this will eventually affect about 50% of us so uh, if you look at uh, 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 these it's not just uh, dementia it's also old age and you combine these into the term frailty now there's a fifth trajectory that has been identified and that is to some extent an artifact of modern you know critical care so uh, somebody who is hit by a a a clot or a truck or a bullet or a bomb or in elderly which means somebody in the late 70s or early 80s actually has a systemic a severe systemic event <coughs> so eventually what you would call a catastrophic event even though they may have been high functioning before that suddenly enter a trajectory at which they are left at a much lower level of function until they eventually pass away so these are uh, uh, three trajectories sudden death of course you don't call it's not really a trajectory it's a marked abrupt ending and this last is an artifact and in fact it's uh, although it dominates our attention quite a bit it's actually in that sense not a large number uh in all these trajectories can we foresee and foretell death and should we be doing so remember that from the time of hippocrates uh it has been one of our duties to prognosticate and to prognosticate ideally in a fashion that is honest accurate and perhaps optimistic and it's it's not very easy to do so uh, very often people actually just avoid it in fact prognostication has declined as one of the skills of uh, doctors over the past i would say almost 100 years and yet at the time of hippocrates he himself said uh 
most excellent thing for the physician to cultivate prognosis for while foreseeing and foretelling. He will be the more readily believed to be acquainted with the circumstances and men will have confidence to entrust themselves to such a physician. Yes, if you cannot tell what is going to happen, then how will you be trusted? And uh, this brings me to the last point, And that is if you take out sudden death, which as I said, is under 10%. 90% of deaths in the older ages are can be anticipated. And if you anticipate them, then you can plan, you can avoid crisis, and you can give care that is tailored to people's wishes so that people live and die in a place and manner of their choice. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, tools that we use is, is what I have referenced on this slide. It's called the gold standards framework. That's a uh, uh, NGO based in the UK, which helps out with uh, palliative care there. And I'm going to be looking at this a little further along. Now, can we recognize terminal illness? And uh, there are actually four indicators or triggers that suggest that somebody is nearing the end of life. Uh, it's important not to predict the exact time, but to start thinking about uh, discussing this issue. And these four indicators are the surprise question, uh, general indicators of decline, specific clinical indicators related to the disease condition, and decisional. And decisional is a little uh, difficult for people to understand. It basically means that at the point that you stop disease-directed therapy and uh, move towards either or shift over focus to comfort care, which means that you stop aggressive care. Let's look at all of them in turn. Now, for patients with advanced disease or progressive life-limiting conditions, if you answer no to the following question, would you be surprised if this patient were to die in the next year? It's also been used in other time frames, but the classic one is the one-year one. And this has to be an intuitive answer. It may not be somebody who uh, has clearly identified advanced disease. Sometimes uh, I've heard of uh, senior uh, physicians look at somebody maybe in a party and say, I don't think, I mean, answer the surprise question. Say, I think somebody is, uh, it, it doesn't have too much time. So this is an intuitive answer. It puts together clinical features, comorbidities and social and other factors to get an entire picture of deterioration. And the accuracy is, as I said, uh, can be fairly reasonable. In fact, in oncology, it reaches about 80%, but even in non-oncology, it is 70% or more. And this is something that, uh, it's a skill that you yourself has to have to activate. What about general indicators of decline? Uh, these are basically decreasing activities for so somebody's performance is declining. They are not able to take care of themselves. They are in bed or chair more than 50% of the day and need support in most activities of daily living. Now, this is something that uh, needs systematic assessment because very often families do not recognize it. They don't recognize that somebody is not as well as they were one year ago, three months ago. Uh, they just, uh, they just continue caring. And it's only when we systematically assess it, we realize that somebody is needing considerable assistance or is almost completely bedridden and so on. And uh, you have various uh, uh, tools for this assessment. Uh, on college dimension is called the fast scale. Hello, I'm audible, no? Yes, sir. Okay, right. So, uh, uh, another thing is that uh, I will be uh, uh, take. I mean, I'll halt in another uh, five, seven minutes, I think, and uh, take questions because since this is a fairly long lecture, it's good if uh, you people put up your questions in the chat box for uh, this section. And we finish this before we go on. 
Right. So if you look at general indicators of decline, uh, we covered the surprise question, then we are looking at general indicators of decline. Remember that comorbidities are the biggest predictive indicator. So somebody who's declining in function and actually has not one, but three diseases, like congestive heart failure, CKD, diabetes, mortis. Yeah, that's, that's where you think that the likelihood of mortality is even higher. Or if disease is advancing, and how do you identify advanced, advanced disease? Not necessarily by uh, investigations. It's also by uh, more and more complex symptom burden. And it can be even one or two simple symptoms which get worse. For instance, in Parkinson's, I know that when a patient gets admitted with obstipation, then again, uh, this is somebody who's likely to not be able to survive uh, long. Uh, or if the response to treatment drops. Uh, so again, in, uh, in uh, COPD, beginning to require home oxygen. There are other indicators as well, uh, weight loss greater than 10% in six months. But one number that I think is underutilized is serum albumin. When it drops below 2.5 grams per cent on somebody's developing uh, 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 generalized edema and so on. Another one is unplanned or crisis admissions. So one number that is often used here is more than two admissions for the same diagnosis within six months. A third admission, and you need to worry if this patient is, if this is the last admission. And then sentinel events. Uh, I told you about somebody who gets into the fifth trajectory after a fall and uh, say a fracture neck fever. But what about something like bereavement, loss of spouse? Don't forget that Queen Elizabeth has passed on about a year after the loss of her husband. Um, so uh, loss of spouse is, 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 is a very major event, obviously. Right. Let's move on to disease-specific guidelines. And you have to understand that of the disease-specific guidelines, these are the most predictable for cancer. And you can understand that once a uh, tumor burden crosses a certain point and is running out of control, it's, it's almost logarithm. And that is what accounts for the waterfall trajectory. And if you add comorbidities to that, you add the failure of, say, a second chemotherapy, then when a patient like this starts spending more than 50% of their time in bed or lying down, uh, their survival is estimated to be about three months or less. Mm, but outside cancer, if you look at organ failures of uh, various kinds, uh, it does tend to become a little erratic and unpredictable. And hence, we use multiple indicators. Um, no. okay. So let's look at heart disease, for instance. Uh, if you remember, I pointed out repeated admissions or dyspnea that is crossing uh, stage three or four, uh, additional features. In COPD, again, recurrent admissions, uh, requiring NIV and so on. In kidney disease, uh, the surprise question, for instance, is pretty effective. Again, repeated unplanned admissions. Uh, in, in the GSF, typically it's three admissions within one year. Uh, in some others, it's two admissions in six months. And uh, it can also be patients choosing the no dialysis option. In liver disease, it's the presence of hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, no indications for liver transplant, and cirrhosis with complications, refractory ascites and so on, or recurrent encephalopathy. So all of these uh, would be indicators for beginning a discussion about the end of life. Um, when it comes to neurologic prognosis, it tends to get uh, rather more complex because all of these are individual diseases and they have their own indicators. And I'm not going to go into all this in detail. So how do you make sense out of all of this? How do you put it into uh, one single score? So there are scores that are now uh, that are available and uh, that have been validated. For instance, this particular score uh, 
uh, is used for predicting one year mortality now if you look at this if you have say a uh, 74 year old gentleman who uh, male who needs assistance with all activities of daily living and has been identified to have congestive heart failure okay eight points now in this score the validated mortality of anybody who has more than six points is 64% now uh, if you were to quote this figure typically somebody will come back and tell you that uh, doctor told that my uh, uncle so and so would pass off within a year and he lived for four years or five years but the point is that if you identify somebody who has a greater than 60% likelihood of mortality within one year so why one year then they are then they are one of the 40% that remain again 60% out of that and as you go on you realize that this figure actually means literally 100% by the end of four years so. so and that's what people need to understand that we often remember outliers but the majority of people follow the statistics and that brings me to the last uh, point and that is decisional so this could be for neurologic decline for frailty which means old age or for multi morbidities people with multiple comorbidities at even in the 70s or 60s uh, where there is progressive deterioration in physical and or cognitive functioning despite optimal therapy the symptoms are complex and too difficult to control uh, especially uh, symptoms that cause uh, swallowing issues or sepsis or because these two often go together speech problems as well so that communication and dysphagia also come um and uh, remember that uh, we now have the means to keep the body alive indefinitely should we choose to do so uh, in 2018 about 4 years ago babra and george bush passed away in their own beds they literally died in darbar uh, there are photographs of them surrounded by uh, children grandchildren uh, former associates pets uh, literally uh, as i said in darbar uh, babra in april 2018 george in november 2018 and in between atal bihari passed away in august 2018 and atal bihari did not die at home in his own bed in state he died on extra corporeal membrane oxygenation which means heart lung is completely taken over in the aims ic of course i feel there was a reason for that uh, he died the day after a big man gave a big speech but anyway um and lata mangeshkar she got intubated twice i mean those incomparable vocal cords were literally ravished twice so my joke about this is that is that if you if any if any of you is an indian vip you are condemned to torture before death but the other point to understand about decisional is that uh, and this separates oncology from non oncology is that in oncology once tumor burden crosses a certain point cancer biology makes all the decisions neither the doctor nor the family really has anything to decide so uh, we get uh, you know conflicted by the ethics of withdrawal or foregoing life support when it is cancer there is cancer biology follows its own ethics here for the rest of uh, non oncologic palliative care there's a fair amount of understanding of ethics legalities and so on and that is why we term these uh, these as decisional so i'm going to stop at this point um, because after this we don't have a case today so i'm going to be presenting uh, three cases uh, but i'm going to do it in the middle of the talk so that uh, we can use some learning from the cases themselves uh, any questions before i go on anything in the chat
Yes, sir. We have one query in the chat from Dr. Parul, who asks okay. when end of life care should begin for children with terminal diseases. Is it same as in adults or different? It is the same as in adults. I mean, if somebody has a terminal disease, once you identify terminal disease, then you have to offer uh, palliative care. And at some point, uh, uh, if uh, uh, life-saving treatments are not going to be useful, the decisions are identical. Anybody else wants to uh, uh, unmute themselves and ask a question? You can raise your hand and we'll take it on. Anyone? No? We go on? Yes, sir. I can move on. Oh, so now I'm going to take you through three cases. Um, and you will kind of understand how these decisions play out. Uh, the last section is actually the uh, managing the end of life. But uh, because you have to understand how you get there, uh, it's this part is to do with that. So the first is this gentleman who, when I... I didn't see him at that time. I saw him much later. At the age of 81, he was a retired bureaucrat. This was January 2014. Became forgetful. Uh, a diagnosis of early dementia was made and he was started on medication, including treatment for mild depression. And he asked the neurologist what will happen. But there was no meaningful discussion. Uh, he was active socially and he had been working till two years prior and probably, you know, internally understanding that he was now declining. He had resigned because he couldn't cope. And he lived with his wife uh, in an apartment, as and is so often the case, both children abroad. Uh, in, by 2018, the decline started to become obvious. Uh, he could maintain his ind independent daily routine, but started to simplify his clothing. And very often, he would ask the same question again and again. Uh, by 2016, he started to need supervision. Uh, for instance, embarrassing things like forgetting to flush. And more importantly, the wife started to get very tired because he would just shadow her constantly. She couldn't just get out of his sight. And by the next year, behavioral issues started to come up. Uh, he didn't like being told to take a bath or change his clothes and occasionally would lose his temper at her. And she was, poor thing, was getting really exhausted. In fact, one incident where he needed to be rescued by the building uh, security because he opened the door and walked out in the middle of the night. And about four years after it started, he came into hospital. Uh, he was admitted with uh, 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 altered mental, uh, altered sensorium, uh, but this was due to urinary tract infection and a hyperfunctioning detrusor was identified and he needed a, and he was given a suprafibic cystostomy because it was not likely to improve. He still was mobile, but his conversation was now limited to maybe about six to eight words. And now the wife asked the neurologist, Ab kya hoga? and again, a same non-specific answer. The end of that year, he came in with a more severe episode, this time with hyponatremia and on discharge, uh, he remained bedbound. Uh, nearly mute, and now he was completely dependent. And another three months later, and you can see this pattern, he came in with recurrent seizures. Now, if you see it, actually speaking, these are all complications of uh, themes on the, sub-themes on the same illness. Uh, and this time he co comes in with seizures, and as he comes into the casualty, he gets intubated, uh, treated with levetacetam and ferret, and the seizures stop immediately. And uh, there are no fresh changes on CT, no, no obvious metabolic cause. He comes off the ventilator and he gets a tricastro. But when it comes to PEG, that is when the family kind of raised a flag and said, what are we doing? And that was the stage at which palliative care got involved. And he was finally, everything was done and he was discharged a month after he came in this time. When he was discharged, uh, he was effectively in the vegetative state. And uh, uh, his wife could not, but his children did ask, why was not palliative care involved earlier? And he was now at home. Uh, his wife also 82 years old. 
hired caregivers and the family physician in our palliative care uh, physician uh, were managing at home uh, and uh, even in spite of all attention he started to the bed sores and finally uh, he had an episode in which he vomited became breathless stopped breathing and he was declared dead by the family physician so you can understand that this is a story where uh, perhaps uh, decisions need to have been taken in advance of events let's look at the missed opportunities one is at diagnosis nobody discussed that dementia had set in and dementia is a terminal disease so this was a stage when he could have made his own wishes if he had been informed of what was coming ahead by the time the first admission came around the terminal nature of the condition was of and at the second admission maybe we should have started planning for not even getting him back into the hospital if that had been done when he came in for seizures he would not have maybe not have been admitted but definitely he would not have been intubated and uh, instead of tracheostomy if we did have intubation we could have done what is called as a palliative exchange so the last stage of his illness would have been less by about two or three months and it has saved a, a fair amount of suffering not just for him but for his family so compare that with a different situation uh, this is cancer where cancer makes all the ethical decisions and uh, patient and family once they are aware uh effectively just decide if they want to get something or not so look at this so this gentleman 76 years old uh pretty socially active one daughter in the us gets intermittent constipation blood in the stool colonoscopy and ca code moderate differential adenocarcinoma and the uh, 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 refer to oncology oncologist it's a left hemicolectomy and uh, post operatively uh, there is a long discussion with the oncologist but guess what the patient noticed because this is what he told me meri beti se hi baat karo what what does that mean he spoke to my daughter and this is something that often happens when we are faced with terminal illnesses we find it difficult to speak directly to the patient and physician and that palliative care physician explained to him what was what could happen what was likely to happen and so on anyway the chemotherapy got completed and he was on three monthly follow up and uh, uh, this began in 2016 2017 by the end of 2017 uh, the follow up pet ct actually turned up extensive metastasis in liver and lungs with an expected survival of four months and he was offered palliative chemo with targeted therapy uh expected median survival of 8 to 10 months best case 24 months but remember that he was uh past his mid 70s so i would actually have said maybe around about 8 or even less um and remember that he had already had some experience with chemotherapy didn't like it very much he chose the palliative care option and the palliative care and he had already been introduced to that idea so he made his own decisions and palliative care did a home visit and then a little while later hospice care was set up at home uh, hospice care is uh, is is management uh, for end of life care at home and uh, uh, it's actually available for oncology in i think all the major metros kerala of course all over and this is something that we should all remember so what happened next in april 2018 Uh, uh, he had a prolonged discussion with the palliative care team together with his wife his daughter and grandson participated on skype and the grandson who actually had just joined a new job asked for and got two months of leave to take care of his nana because everybody knew what was coming and nana was of course now in bed most of the time he made sure that uh, both uh, his grandparents filled up uh, living wills for themselves and the palliative care team discussed what is termed anticipatory 
by may 2018 further decline appetite down to occasional mouthfuls and the daughter was now called because they knew it was not very far away and literally he waited to meet her and passed away the next day so you can see the difference between neurologic and non oncologic death now this is the biologic difference defined trajectory and prognosis uh, erratic or prolonged trajectory so recurrent admissions and organ failure sometimes may be unavoidable in dementia there's an early loss of personhood and the medical response to this on this side is expensive and avoidable icu care uh, here provided there is transparency patient and family retain control the important thing is that even if families doctors everybody is aware that things are going down there are ethical decisions to be made about not doing things that it sometimes feels you know intuitively wrong for us you will not intubate you will take out the rice tube uh, you will uh, let your uh, mother starve to death so these are questions that come from doctors because we don't understand that these are decisions that have to be taken whereas here on the cancer side cancer is taking all the decisions and that to me is the major challenge in non oncology or neuro palliative that uh here the road ahead is distinctly more complex and typically you'll find i'm sorry to put it most of classic palliative care staying out of it right what is the diagnosis is simple old age remember that human life expectancy is not expected to increase much beyond 80 years so we have but we do have a concept of chronologic age versus biologic age so you have people who are in their 90s and look as though they are in the 70s and people who are in their 60s and look at as though they are in the 80s so you have to be aware of both but generally they match and you understand that after the age of 80 uh oh, things can go wrong very easily right so this lady was 80 years old and uh, she had very bad diabetes but it was to some extent controlled uh because she had spells of hypoglycemia and dk uh they moved out of mumbai to nasik with her 87 year old husband because her daughter lived there and she was otherwise okay she settled into a new home the daughter insisted on having servants in she was she was pretty active socially otherwise the first illness was in april 2016 it was just fever and diarrhea but she collapsed and needed admission to the icu and got discharged later that year fracture neck fever needed hip replacement transient post op delirium but then recovered way and she even began walking at three months but you can see that this is where uh old age is now speaking of speed and then the sentinel event in march 2017 her husband collapsed and passed away after three days of vague chest pain and mild fever uh he got he was admitted multi organ failure was diagnosed and his wife confirmed dni and dnar do not intubate do not attempt resuscitation why did she do that this was because after her illness both husband and wife spoke to their daughter made it clear that there were going to be no heroic measures in fact they wanted their bodies to be donated to the medical college and uh, in spite of the passing away of her husband because the granddaughter moved in to live with her she was actually a uh, pretty much happy except that the next illness began with multiple superficial soft tissue abscesses this happened in uh, january 5 2018 and she was actually admitted twice to be given iv antibiotics but by march 2018 it was obvious that the abscesses were not going so she was discharged for home care with daily dressings and that is when she asked what is happening and she was told the medicines are not working and her decision was very clear i will not go to hospital again and the only painkiller she would take was paracetamol she she was offered morphine at a point but she said no by end april her activities had started to reduce she started needing help with all basic activities of daily living except feeding appetite went down 
food and water intake went down. And the second week of June, she started to become delirious. And then she would have pain even on turning over in bed. Vital signs started to decline. Urine output came down. And three days later, the day she stopped speaking, she stopped breathing later the same day. So this was active diet. So if you see these three patients, you understand that foreseeing and foretelling is at the end of life is not only possible, but actually should be done. Now, why is it that we don't do it? We put all of this under the term, broad term, serious illness communication. Uh, before the middle of the 20th century, remember that we didn't have treatments for so many things. So a physician had to diagnose, had to treat with whatever was available, but had to foresee and foretell. Now, as medical treatments improved, remember the first ICU started in the 60s and 70s, the skill of prognosis declined everywhere in teaching, in research and practice. And remember that uh, foreseeing has to be accompanied by foretelling. Together, they make up prognostication. To foretell, you have to be able to pitch that information with honesty, accuracy, but also give it some amount of optimism using communication skills. Um, but foretelling is difficult. To tell people that bad things are going to happen to them is something that hurts us. It stresses us. And if we are not trained in doing it, this is something that we avoid. Unfortunately, when you avoid foretelling, your foresight atrophies and you actually stop foreseeing. So the skill of prognosis declines, diminishes, and finally disappears. Now, when you are speaking to families, patients about end of life care, what do you talk about? The first is goals of care. So this is our responsibility. You're basically uh, educating the family about what is happening. And you can do it over multiple visits. It doesn't have to be done in one go. It basically, it's simple things like, I don't want to go to hospital again. Uh, I don't want to be dependent on anybody. Uh, in Hindi, uh, I've heard patients say, Mujhe haste khelte jana, which means I want to pass off in peace and so on. Uh, now, yes, these are wishes. How do you make those wishes happen? To make those wishes happen, you need a system. The system documents this information, makes it actionable. And the most important part of making it actionable is choosing somebody who will make sure that it happens. So a proxy decision maker. Because at the end of life, most of us are not going to be speaking. Now, this has to be legally valid. In India, it is now valid. But it also has to be backed by public policy. For instance, in the United States, there is a central government act which says that any hospital uh, that is supported by the central government or gets money from the central government, when that patient, when a patient is admitted, they have to ask them if they have their advanced care plan ready. Like taking a signature for uh, a consent, this has to be done at admission. Anyway. Uh, when you do all of this, then you reach a situation that is called shared decision making. So that you combine uh, what the patient or family wants, which is basically their values, preferences, with our inputs about prognosis and feasible choices so that we make appropriate decisions moment to moment. So when you set goals of care, you have to both explain and communicate, find out how much they understand. But at this point, you have to actually stop and say, how much do you want to know? There are about 20% of patients will tell you, I don't want to tell him, tell her. Very rarely will somebody say, nothing, let whatever is to happen, happen. The majority of people do want to know. And then you have to bring in the concept of uncertainty because uh, we are not, we cannot really give exact day and time. Only an astrologer can do that. But we can give a trend and we can show them the trend. 
the most important thing to do is find out the patient's wishes about place of care. Uh, and also, does the caregiver agree? Because sometimes at the end of life, uh, the caregiver may not be able to manage. And you have to uh, reconcile the two. Remember that these wishes and plans may change over time. So uh, typically, uh, would one somebody want to pass away at, uh, uh, at home or in hospital? Uh, typically, nobody says ICU. Yeah? And uh, uh, all the people may prefer hospice. In India, we have hospices only for cancer. But they can be asked about whether they would want life-saving treatments at the end of life. Now, when you talk of life-saving treatments, we everybody understands ventilators. Not too many people are aware of cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Uh, dialysis also people understand. What people are not aware is a clear decision is the mode of feeding. The rice tube and a percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy are included in life-saving therapies and can be refused. So typically, if a rice tube has been placed, it has to be changed at the end of three or four weeks. The patient has a right, or the family has a right to say, do not put it in again. And it's also parenteral medications other than those required for symptom control. So even antibiotics, chemotherapy, even IV fluids. And this is where ethical decision making comes into play. Uh, and this is what I mean by saying that very often for neurologic or non oncologic care, these are decisions. Right. So if you do it well, it improves patients' quality of life because they get a sense of control over their last days. It reduces conflict and stress in surviving family members, which is obvious. And as far as the system is concerned, it decreases the use of unwanted intensive medical interventions and CPR at the end of that. The challenges are that for the patient is the fear of death. It's difficult to think or talk about, but you can open up these discussions. And for clinicians, it's partly the lack of time or the perceived lack of time. Actually, I found that if you do it right, it doesn't take much time. In fact, it all flows together uh, if you are doing it right from the beginning. And we find it difficult to discuss prognosis because we think we, we can't tell. Actually, we can. So it is not done. One, of course, families don't see the timeline of decline. It's not something that is their business. Clinicians do not see it either or see it and ignore it or don't know how to handle it. I'm repeating this point. If you do not know how to foretell, your foresight will act up. So to do this foretelling, you use communication skills. It's a learned skill, like surgery. You need training with mentorship and supervised work. And when you practice, you need to reflect on what you've done. Uh, ideally, you need assessment and certification. And when you perform it, when you are entering into a discussion of breaking bad news or serious illness communication, this does need preparation and after you've done the procedure you need to review and reflect on it and see what you could have done well and what did not go well and so on and over a period of time let me assure you this is not book knowledge this is something that you learn with practice unfortunately this is me trying to tell my senior colleagues that they need to learn communication skills very difficult right so i'm going to stop at this point again and uh, ask the questions because now we are on the last about 40 percent of the lecture which is actually the major part of the talk little less than part any questions nothing in the chat nothing in the chat sir yeah okay so let's move on we'll we'll say off everything for the end right so how do we know when a person is actively dying? Remember that these are purely clinical symptoms and signs. Uh, active dying are the hours or days preceding death during which time the physiological functions uh, go down. You have to prepare the family and caregivers for the natural process of dying. And the care now becomes multidisciplinary and holistic. Remember, it also includes after-death care and bereavement support. Months to weeks before death. Months to weeks. No numbers but months to weeks, that gives you a kind of a frame, is what we call pre-active dying, when somebody's ambulation decreases, 
Remember that 50% figure? Uh, withdrawal from family and friends, oral intake starts to decline, occasional incontinence, increased fatigue. The other markers that I've pointed out uh, of uh, general indicators of decline, they all start to appear. Weeks to days before death is, is when uh, uh, active dying begins. And in active dying, the first thing that appears is delirium. That is, the brain starts to malfunction. So, of course, together with there is also there are also uh, vital signs start to decline, but there's drowsiness and decreased urine output. Typically, anybody who puts out, I mean, because sometimes the patient is not telling you. So you ask them, how many times did you need to change the diaper? Less than three times. That's it. So normally, we should be able to pass, you should pass urine at least four times in 24 hours. And this is somebody who's confined to bed and is no longer able to speak. Days to hours before death is imminent death. This is when vital signs also start to go. So consciousness goes down, breathing becomes irregular. And because secretions are not swallowed, you get the death rattle. Hemodynamic changes appear. The face relaxes and becomes yellow. And for me, this is often a marker that breathing starts to have a mandibular component. That's gasping. And gasping, uh, we don't know why it occurs. It's possibly because of uh, uh, reduced blood, blood flow in the brainstem. But this is a visual marker that I think all of us do recognize. So the goals of caring are basically to ensure the patient's comfort, to make the end of life peaceful and dignified, and support the dying patient and their carer so they remember that the dying process as positively as possible. You focus on comfort. And uh, not only do you review the drug charts uh, but for removing unnecessary medicines, but you also put up drugs that may be required SOS to control symptoms. And then you manage symptoms. Uh, the first is not a symptom. It's actually partly life-saving treatment. Is That's a decision about maintaining nutrition and hydration. This is somebody whose appetite is going down, is averse to food, maybe having inability to swallow because stomatitis and so on. And the family starts to get worked up. That how do we maintain it? What do we give? And you have to explain to them that uh, the intake is going down because the body is shutting down. It's not the other way around. Feeding tubes do not enhance survival or quality of life. If you put in an RT, you have to tie the patient down because the patient gets agitated and you can increase pressure ulcers and they do not reduce the risk of aspiration. So you have to put the overall interest and quality of life into account. And as far as possible, if uh, clinically assisted nutrition and hydration is in place, remember that overhydration has to be avoided. So typically people don't require more than about a liter at this time. Ideally, what you do is careful hand feeding. Provide the food items which the patient likes. It could be normal or mashed. You may use nutritional supplements, not really. Uh, give good mouth care to alleviate thirst. Usually ice pieces work well and you moisten and lubricate the lips. And the family is told that when you were her child, she fed you by hand. That is the least you can do at this stage of her life. And uh, you cannot outsource your duty to a rice tube. Uh, in, in Hindi, we call it seva. I, I tell them, seva ap haat se kar sakte, tube se nahi. So again, you have to inform the family that the body is shutting down and the intake is going down accordingly. Your fluid requirement goes down to about a liter per day. Um, and I'm just repeating uh, what I said earlier. No IV fluids because you get pulmonary edema. Uh, hand feeding or with spoon. Remember that if you do it carefully, the aspiration risk is managed. And then you look at medicines. Stop all medicines that are not required for symptom control. If there are important medicines that need to be continu continued or required, then you give them subcutaneously. Remember that IV antibiotics are not required. Aspirin and statins are for the next decade. They're useless for the next few days. Vitamin supplements also go. Typically, sugars are dropping. And uh, oral hypoglycemic medications and insulin can probably stop. Uh, other psychoactive medicines can all be stopped. 
remember that the end of life symptoms that bother patient and family the most important is pain and the next is delirium agitation of course incontinence dyspnea and so on also come and we look at all of them in sequence but the first is you have to decide the route of medications the best and you will learn this in, you must have learned this in your course is the subcutaneous route it's easy to set up it's low maintenance it can be changed repeatedly and in a fragile old individual where veins are difficult to get it allows you a, a, a safe method of access uh, pain is the most common symptom the presentation is varied if somebody is severely demented then you have to use non verbal indicators of pain but you have to anticipate and treat it effectively preferably with opioids and of course if you do have a way of giving it uh, into the stomach okay but otherwise then subcutaneous sometimes you may need to titrate it rapidly if there is severe pain if a patient is restless and agitated actually look first for three major items retention constipation and pain uh if there is pain well uh, opioids in very severe doses can cause delirium but uh, if there is active pain obviously the pain is not good the review medications anticholinergics need to go out increase natural light i always insist on putting my patient in a place where there is daylight if possible get them out of bed remove restraints cut out the unnecessary noise and try and protect the patient's sleep with minimized interventions in the night hours it can't happen in an icu uh, try sleeping in an icu there are bright lights all around there's all kinds of noise and things going on and you have to have conversation with the patient but with an easy tone if nothing else then you can use haloperidol uh remember that benzodiazepines whether it's uh, 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 lorazepam or diazepam they actually can be activating and can worsen delirium so you don't use benzodiazepines here the next symptom is breathlessness so there are four principles here first is correct the correctable so if there is pleural fluid get it out if there is failure use diuret diuretics the second is that air movement on the fan improves symptoms so a simple fan near the face a stable fan on the face actually helps reduce the perception of dyspnea and here morphine is extremely useful the doses that are used are actually uh, much smaller but you can combine that for this uh, 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 as an anxiolytic you can use a small dose of a benzodiazepine and if the breathless is refractory you might have to use palliative sedation which will come to a little bit for nausea and vomiting again reverse the reversible here the main reversible causes of constipation hypokalemia and hypocalcemia the first line drugs are metoclopramide haloperidol and ondansetron ondansetron is safe in terms of extrapyramidal side effects but it is not as effective and at this stage you really aren't worried about uh, uh, causing parkinsonism with the long so you just use this people have also used dexamethasone and high dose sedatives second line drugs like cyclizine are also used and uh, 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 the most of these the first three drugs are available as iv and subcutaneous uh, medications the next is the death rattle now these are pooled secretions uh, the type 1 is when swallowing is impaired so they are all accumulated in the throat and type 2 is when they are in the bronchial uh, tree uh this is a fairly good predictor of death and the family has to be told that this is not causing any distress to the patient it's the noise that is bothering you the management ideally is non pharmacological so you you reposition uh you you can remove the secretions from the angle of the mouth using a finger wrapped in gauze suctioning has to be avoided because it's uncomfortable and it only stimulates more secretions and then of course you can use pharmacological means like glycopyrrolate and hyoscine um for the nurses mouth care is important pressure sore prevention is important and these are patients uh, who well uh, if they are not able to pass urine this is a patient who needs a foley catheter to be in place uh, constipation has to be monitored if need be you might need to do manual evacuation and then you prepare for the end now most patients will stop breathing and the heart will stop but there are two dramatic events that 
depending on the situation, you have to watch out and prepare the family. The first is epileptic seizures, which happens in all, which can happen in all neuro cases and even other illnesses. The most important thing is to prevent harm. Don't force objects into the mouth. You cannot give oral medications at this stage. So subcutaneous midazolam or anti-epileptic drug has to be given to quieten the patient. Remember that the patient will gradually become unconscious, quiet, and will stop moving. If this is a terminal illness, this is not a patient who needs to go into the ICU and get strong anti -epileptics. The more dramatic event than that is what is called the blowout hemorrhage. Now, this happens it's somewhat more common in India. This occurs with oral malignancy because the neck arteries get infiltrated. And this has to be discussed in advance. When it starts, uh, if a palliative care person is there, it's an emergency. You just have to be there. So the first thing is you keep dark towels, preferably green, and apply steady pressure because you can't see blood on uh, this. You just see a dark stain. And the patient has to be quickly sedated with full doses of midazolam. And obviously, then they pass away. Now, there will be situations in which you may have to give sedation beyond the point of safety. Uh, this is called palliative sedation. Your goal is light sleep and comfort. Your intent is to provide sleep. The natural process of death is continuing. You are maintaining the sanctity of life, but you may hasten death. And that is called the double effect, and it is considered ethically acceptable. This is com compared to euthanasia, where sedatives are used to relieve suffering, but by terminating life. And here the intent is to terminate life. It actually stops the natural process, and death is actively accelerated. This is, <coughs> at the moment, unacceptable in most countries, and in fact, illegal in India. Remember that the family needs support because they may be suffering as much and even more than the patient. And you have to address social, spiritual, and religious needs. Uh, if you're confirming death at home, wash hands, confirm identi identity, watch for signs of life, uh, look for a response, voice, pain, pupils, feel for pulse, give it at least three minutes, wash hands, exit. And that is when you need to document it and inform the family members. Um, at the end of life, probably the greatest needs that one has are to be treated as a living human being until the moment of death. Uh, ideally, with a sense of hopefulness, you have the right to participate in decisions about your care, to have your questions answered. And even though cure is no longer possible, continuing medical and nursing attention should be your right. You should be able to die in peace and dignity, not in pain and not alone. Uh, you, you should not be judged for your decisions that may be contrary to the beliefs of others and to expect that the sanctity of your body will be respected after death. Ideally, you have to be cared for by caring, sensitive, knowledgeable people who will attempt to understand your needs. And if anybody is interested, this is quite an old document. It's almost, I think, about 30 years old. My rights at the end of life. Uh, after that, a bereavement visit is preferable if possible. Uh, I personally usually make a phone call. Uh, for palliative care teams, it's important to collect back unused opioids, and you need to explain grief to the family. Grief, normal grief, has a wave character. So there are days when, or hours when, the bereaved individuals will be just motionless and then it will pass off and you have to explain to them that these waves will go and that you will it may come again and gradually the waves will decline but you have to be prepared to identify complicated grief and we'll come to that so the most important thing is anticipatory guidance if you explain what is happening what is likely to happen and prepare them much of these symptoms much of this bereavement actually happens earlier you have to be available to answer questions and assure that symptom control will continue. Religious concerns. So for instance, uh, you know, typically if it's uh, for me, uh, I mean, if you inform the family, then holy water and things, then all of those happen. And you can always enlist help of the medical team in the community. Typically, 
uh, if if it's a patient who's been discharged from uh, my hospital, Hinduja Hospital, then uh, we team up with the local general practitioner and uh, our palliative care doc uh, helps uh, guide him or her through the last days. Now, remember that bereavement is a period. Grief is the natural distress. Mourning is the outward expression of that grief. And when somebody dies, they will actually have gone through many losses before they actually pass away. Uh, grief is experienced differently based on culture, the nature of loss, sudden versus expected, and the relationship to the deceased. Remember that for a 50-year-old spouse, again, Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip, uh, this, this bereavement is something that finally ends in death. So, the types of grief that you need to identify uh, are the first is integrated, that is normal grief, which where the sadness over the loss of a loved one gets accepted and assimilated into normal life. Acute grief is, is, a, is a intense uh, feeling which takes place after the death or loss of a loved one, and then they start to decline. Complicated grief is grief response that persists longer than uh, it is expected to and exceeds uh, social, cultural, religious norms. Uh, typically, we would take it, I mean, people have defined it varying from one to 12 months, but I think six months is a reasonable period. And beyond six months, uh, a person might need treatment. We are supposed to continue bereavement support at least for a year, uh, identify caregivers who are at risk of complicated grief, and ideally, uh, much of this can be done with bereavement support groups. So the key messages here are that terminal illness can be identified. You have to shift focus to symptom control, comfort and quality of life. The active dying phase has to be recognized and the family must be prepared. Family support begins before death and continues afterward as well. Uh, now there is a bonus section, which is to do with why don't we do all of this and what can we do as citizens? So I'm going to again break for a few minutes, take questions, and then move into the last phase. Uh, anything in the chat? Yeah. Uh, only that appreciation material. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, I'll, I, please, please don't be uh, spellbound. I, I need uh, live answers. Live questions, sorry. Otherwise, I, it's, not, it's not very nice. Right. Um, so, why does the medical profession shy away from all of this? What doctors feel is a lack of legal clarity. We are not actually mandated to do this. Uh, we don't have a law which says you must do this, you must not do that. Because typically, until you're told thou shalt, thou shalt not, on pain of one kind of tends to avoid things one is uncomfortable with. And on top of it, earlier we used to have this fear of criminal charges and litigation, which I'll explain to you is not there so. Uh, unfortunately, what we find difficult to do, civil society sees as perverse incentives, corporatization. You want to keep the patient in hospital because you want to earn money. What they don't realize is that even in corporate hospitals, ICUs, the maximum earning in the first is in the first three to five days. After that, it's just a bed occupancy. So uh, this is something that we need to challenge, but we need to challenge it by approaching or taking care of what we lack. One is difficulties in establishing prognosis. It's simple with cancer, but less so with other, other diseases. And there's a certain move to starting to establish uh, better trials and so on for getting these figures and uh, details out. If you look for prognosis, typically you'll find case series, not uh, randomized trials. But the most important thing is lack of capacity. Now, in most advanced countries, com skills are specifically addressed. Remember that you have a certain amount of cognitive knowledge about your specialty. You have a certain amount of technical knowledge of your specialty. But when it comes to actually delivering that knowledge about talking to people and to patients and to the rest of society, 
nobody trains us in that and this is a major lack you know which is now beginning to be addressed but still some way to go uh, and as medical progress took place um, our role where doctors knows best ended and human equality became understood in all facets of life uh, antibiotics icu care organ transplants all meant that people survived severe illnesses and death became medicalized it moved into icus it moved into hospitals in the 50s till the 60s people died at home now you think about it how often do people die at home uh, as medical paternalism ended uh, in the us uh, it was not just consumer rights it was also the ingress of human rights also uh, the first living wills were discussed by a human rights lawyer and it became because the us individual states can do their own thing uh, literally the states the individual states started to become uh, started to compete and the us became the world's laboratory eventually the patient self determination act which i told you about where a patient who's admitted to a hospital that is supported by the central government will be asked at admission whether they have a living will on the other side from the united kingdom palliative care began and that is how these two concepts spread across the world now when we look at ethics we look at the first autonomy beneficence non maleficence justice but there is also dignity and honesty the problem is how do you put it together so there is something called the four box model where you look at basically just medical indications or you look at patient preference or you look at quality of life outcomes or you look at contextual features contextual features means that justice a, a ventilator for a 90 year old would mean death for a 30 year old with diabare syndrome waiting for a ventilator so there is that element of justice also when resources are scarce what do we depend on what is our legal framework the first of course is the constitution of india and then we have something called common law where judges actually make these uh, uh, apply the constitution to specific situations and there are supreme court judgments that actually have helped out but more important than supreme court judgments are professional guidelines because if you go wrong then the judges are going to say did you follow what your profession told you to do and that is what people don't understand i have been involved in this issue since 2011 i was on the uh, committee that uh, looked at the uh, at aruna shanbag and we were with the uh, i mean we were involved with the judgment and remember that in 2011 that judgment decriminalized the whole process okay it said that withdrawal of life sustaining treatment from a person incapable of giving consent was no longer criminal and uh, it also in fact spoke about the withdrawal of support but for aruna shanbal because the nurses who were taking care of her wanted her to continue they he said it was okay the major judgment came out in 2018 which took over all the previous judgments and kind of made sense out of everything and they took it back to the constitution and these were some of the statements that were made one of the most important statements that all adults a competent person who has come of age has the right to refuse specific treatment or all treatment or opt for an alternative treatment even if such decision entails a risk of death the emergency principle can be given effect to only when it is not practical to obtain the patient's consent but where a patient has already made a valid advance directive which is free from reasonable doubt and specifying that he or she does not wish to be treated then such directive has to be given effect so when we practice remember that the constitution and constitutional morality is based on ethics we have practice we have practical guidelines and we have professional policies in between come laws and judgments and they kind of balance these two and uh, if you look at professional guidelines uh, a proper end of life care was written up by my colleagues uh, in elicit in 2014 and this is been valid policy for both the palliative care and the intensive care societies uh, unfortunately not many people are aware that this is there but if if in doubt it's quite i mean this is what the judges will rely on 
and there are more documents uh, this judgment then the all india institute uh, medical sciences in delhi put out a full document on how to manage end of life care it's available there on our, on their website uh, kasturwa hospital and the manipal group have the blue maple document which is somewhat similar in fact these people came out earlier uh, the icmr i was part of the group that wrote out the do not attempt resuscitation or the dnar guideline and our group has put out a basic living will which is parallel to this judgment and which is available on the pallium india website and uh, uh, remember that if you are looking at withdrawing treatment if a patient is in hospital if then these other this is the kind of way we would go about it ideally this has to be backed by hospital policy uh, the treating team has to have consensus so that the involved consent consultants have all agreed that this is now futile we we insist on signatures from three consultants on the patient or the family side if it is a competent patient the competent patient decides if then there is an written advance medical directive that is next the third is the presence of surrogate decision makers and there you have to confirm the hierarchy and sure make sure that they are they have consensus if they are in argument you stop at that point and you document everything it has to be signed out by appropriate surrogates and three consultants and ideally with hospital policy you have to get post facto audit to make sure that the process was done right uh the living will that uh, we have made and that is up on the pallium india website uh, is in line with uh, the, the, these discussions so it actually comes into uh, effect only when the patient cannot take part in decision making uh, and if the patient has a state from which he or she cannot be expected to recover uh, a panel of three doctors is required to confirm that and if at that time then you can tick all of these any of these or all of these all of these can be removed or they should not be instituted and again there is scope for it's not just scope it is an essential feature is to identify a surrogate decision maker the surrogate decision maker can use their discretion but you can also tie their hands down and say that only to secure compliance uh, you identify three they don't work as a committee they basically if first is not available then second if second then third typically if they are members of a family then you do require they all that they all come together and remember that the living will can be revoked instantly orally it is it comes into effect only with signature in writing but it can be revoked orally uh, as of now it has to be signed by before a judicial magistrate first class to make it legally enforceable but if it is done right if the family is supporting it if there are witnesses and we require two witnesses then it is valid so please understand there's a difference between enforceable and valid uh uh when i when i talk about this to lay audiences i uh, ask them to begin by speaking to those close to you choose your surrogates carefully and make sure that the sign before two witnesses ideally in front of a judicial magistrate first class where at least this much up to this much everybody can do this step is a little tough even now and more importantly i tell lay people that you must show it to doctors so that doctors you can find out if your doctor will support it you can the doctor can find out if the hospital will accept it and either way the family and the doctor will know your wishes i'm going to stop at this point no uh, we are we still have i think about 7 minutes to go so i'm going to stop sharing my email id and my uh, mobile number here i'm happy to accept uh, whatsapps or uh, uh, emails if you run into any issues and you want some guidance but uh, i will stop at this point and we'll take questions right there we are thank you dr ro as expected always an excellent presentation i believe uh, the feedbacks in between your uh, session proved that so in case you have any queries related to the session please do feel free to unmute yourself and ask or put it in the chat box
thank you indira ji um <laughs> including this in academics yes the itcom is happening so uh the itcom is uh, a, a module which is now supposed to be introduced from undergraduate days onwards so there are different cases that come up at different times and uh, uh, different levels of discussion that happen and uh, hopefully by another 10 years or so you'll see the differences but for those of us who have already passed out yeah this is knowledge that has to be retrofitted so we have to take the trouble of like you people have taken the trouble of signing up for this course we have to make sure that more and more of us take on this responsibility right are we done right oh uh, thank you everyone for your patient listening and for your thanks and uh, feel free to reach out uh, you will get this uh, presentation from uh, palium the uh, slides so that's so you can uh, use those wherever you like thank bye you, i'll sign thank out you. chalo uh, bye thank you sir thank you for joining we know how we see a person you are and still no, no, that's okay you found out time for our cohort thank you so much and this thank is, you this everyone. is important thank you everyone bye. for joining in bye sir and uh, thank you everyone so with that note this is vipriya along with dr roop gosani signing off see you tomorrow with another session till then everyone take care bye bye